Lord, just allow us to rest in your presence this morning. And Lord, as we look at your word this morning, we just pray that you would guide us, that you would direct us, that you would open our hearts and our minds to know you, to know your word, to be drawn close to you, to be in that intimate communion with you, to know that it is you that have put the breath of life into our lungs, and it is you that has redeemed us, and it is you that loves us tremendously. Father, we just thank you for that. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Laura and I have had a pretty busy weekend. We uh, left Friday um, to head up to Austin, spent the night with her dad, and Sean was running in a track meet up there. And those of y'all that, that know me know I don't drink coffee very much. In fact, really ever. I just, I don't know, just never picked up the habit. But I, I don't drink coffee or tea or, I don't drink sodas, actually. So, um, actually, we have a very low caffeine intake. And the one time here just recently I've started to do that is when I'm on the road and I'm wanting to stay awake driving, I'll, I'll pick up one of the, like the Starbucks iced um, coffees at Bucky's or somewhere. Um, and so I've, I've kind of done that here recently. So anyways, we were driving up and I, I, uh, I was tired Friday afternoon and grabbed one of those and, and drank a coffee. And we got up there and the, the track meet went incredibly long. Like, I, I think it was probably the longest one. We've done a lot of track meets, right? That's what our kids have done. That we've done a lot of track meets. This had to be the longest one. I think it was over 12 hours. And so it just, it was ridiculous. And so halfway through between um, races, I had gone down to the car because on Saturdays, I always spend an hour or two and go over um, the passage it just refresher from what I've prepared early in the week, but just to have that refresher. And so I, I'd gone down to the car and I was tired. We had been sitting in the sun and outside all day. And so I went and I, I got a, one of those big giant lemon iced teas, a little bit of extra caffeine, right? So I had drank coffee on the way up. I drank a, a tea, um, looking at it. And then we drove home last night. And so we left Austin at like 9.30. Dripping Springs, 9.30, I think. Um, anyway, so another coffee on the way home. Uh, a Dunkin' one this time. And, and so we, we make it home. and our, yeah, it, They're like a dollar and a half cheaper. Yeah. So anyway, so I drink another one on the way home. And it's like, wow, you know, these things work pretty well. <laughs> I'm getting up this morning. Sean's bus got in last night. So he has to ride the, the charter bus back with the team. His bus comes in at half, it was later than two. Um, and so it was late last, late night. I'm getting up this morning thinking, oh, yeah, I understand the appeal of this coffee stuff now. Right? I'm a, I'm a little slow learner. I'm in my mid-40s, and I'm, I'm figuring out this, wow, I see why people drink this stuff. I didn't have any this morning, but <laughs> um, I understand. Sometimes it takes us a little bit of time to really see what's going on. Right? Sometimes we pick up things a little bit slow. This morning, when we look through the end of, of Genesis here, this is the last section that we're going to take out of our study on the life of Joseph. And we see Jacob, and he has some insight into being able to identify the things that are happening in his life, specifically the blessing that's happening in his life. So often for us, we fail to identify the blessings that are happening in our life. And, and it, it becomes difficult for us to see both how God has been blessing us, what he's doing right now, what he's going to do in the future. Jacob does a good job with that. He identifies the blessing. So we're going to take a look at how he does that as he, bless, he passes the blessing on to his kids. That's kind of the last few chapters here that we're going to lump together. And so we're going to take a look at how he passes that blessing on and what we can glean for that for our life as we look at how God has blessed us and will bless us in the future. All right, so that's kind of where we're going. 
So first of all, we'll look at how Joseph, or sorry, Jacob here is responding uh, to this idea of blessing. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Genesis 48. As I said, this is kind of the very end of the story, and we will transition next week. Uh, but the very end of the story, so the 30-second recap, is that Joseph had been sold by his brothers into slavery. He's taken down to Egypt. In Egypt, he's a slave, he's imprisoned, but God lifts him up. God redeems that, and he rises to being the second person in command in all of Egypt, overseeing them, collecting during the, the years of plentiful, so that Egypt is the only place that has grain in the years of famine. Jacob, his father, and all his brothers are in the land of Canaan, in the promised land. They're starving, so they come to Egypt 20 years later to buy food, and surprisingly, come to their brother, who they sold into slavery. Right? So that's kind of what's gone on. Now since then, Joseph has forgiven his brothers. We've talked about the forgiveness. And he's brought his dad, he's brought his brothers. All of them have come down to Egypt with him so that he can take care of them. All right? So his, his dad's finally there with him. 20 years later, his dad thought he was dead, never thought he would see him again. And now he's there in the land with him. All right, so that's kind of where we are. Jacob, his dad now, is at the end of his life. That's these last couple chapters here. That's what we're looking at today. He's at the very end of his life. And this is what he says in, in chapter 48, and verse 3. I'll pick up here. It says, Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz in the land of Cana and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous, and will make you a company of peoples, and will give this land to your descendants after you for an everlasting possession. So what's Jacob doing there? He is remembering and he is recounting the blessing that God has given him in the past. Right? That's the real key here. God has blessed him in the past, and he's remembering, he's recounting what God has done for him. And, and for Jacob specifically, right, he has a lot to remember. His family was chosen, right? God chose Abraham and promised that through Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed. We see that repeatedly in the life of Abraham. It starts off in, in chapter 12 of Genesis. God says that I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And through you, and through your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. He repeats it again. And I'm, I just want to flip over and look at it so we fully understand here the blessing that Jacob is remembering. In chapter 22, he repeats it again in Genesis to Abraham. What's going on in chapter 22 is that he has been asked to offer his son Isaac, his one and only son. So Abraham doesn't have a, a, a son until very late in life. He, he does have a son with, the, uh, with a handmaiden, and, and there's a little bit there. But um, Isaac is the, the son of his wife Sarah, right? And so very late in life, he, he has this son Isaac. And God has told him, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through your descendants. He has this one son here that, that God's going to do that through. And then God says, I want you to offer him up to me. This was his prized possession in a lot of ways. You know, we, we've seen in the story of Jacob how he had Joseph as his prized possession, his child, his, his favored son, and later it was Benjamin. But he had a lot of sons. Abraham only has the you know the one that's living with him at the time. And so he only has the one. It's his, his prized possession. So God asked him to offer up Isaac. He does that. But before he really puts him on the altar, God stops him. And then this is God's response to him here in 22. It starts in verse 16. It says, And said, my, This is God speaking to Abraham. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, 
because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That's the blessing. That, that's Jacob's family. That's his grandfather. That's his family. That's the blessing. Through him, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So Jacob is remembering that because God has repeated it to Abraham. He's repeated it to Isaac. He's repeated it to Jacob himself, right? So if we flipped over a couple more verses here, we see it in, in chapter 28 when he repeats it very specifically to Jacob. In 28, and it starts off in verse 10, uh, Jacob's recounting this, and he had just shared with Joseph that God came to me and God shared with me and God told me he was going to be blessed. Th this is where that happened. This is what he's remembering. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of that place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth, which its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham and the God of Isaac, the land in which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So we see it repeated again to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. That's what he's remembering. God's made this promise of blessing. And even late in his life, he's remembering, he's recalling, he's saying, God has, has promised to bless me. All right, so that's the first thing he does. He remembers where God has promised. Here's the second thing he does. He recognizes the blessing currently happening in his life. He remembers the past, but he also recognizes what's currently happening. But, and think about where Jacob is, right? He was promised this land in the promised land, but because of famine, because his family's starving to death, he has to move down out of it to Egypt. He's in a place that he's not real happy about. He, he doesn't want to be in Egypt. He, he's glad to see Joseph, but he doesn't really want to be in Egypt because he knows that God has promised him the land in Cana. And, and so he, he has to go to this foreign land it, to the extent, to the extent that when he's going to die, what's he asked them to do? He says, you need to take me back to Canaan to bury me. So he, does, he doesn't want to be there at all. That's not his home. Right? He wants to return to the promised land. But while he's there, he still recognizes how God is blessing him. If we look at verse, uh, in, in chapter 48 in Genesis, if we look at verse 11, Look at how he recognizes the blessing. He says, Israel said to Joseph, or Jacob, also called Israel, said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. He was gone for 20 years, sold into slavery. I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your children as well. He recognizes the blessing of what God is doing in his life currently. Not just what he's done in the past, but currently, even though he's in a foreign land, even though he had to flee the promised land because of famine, he recognizes the blessing of being able to see Joseph and Joseph's children. He recognizes what's going on at the time. Here's the third thing he does. He recognizes the past promises. He recognizes the current. And he remembers and recognizes that God promises to bless in the future. God is blessing us now. Or God is blessing Jacob. We haven't gotten to the us really yet, but um, he's recognizing that God is going to bless in the future as well. Look at verse 21 as we kind of walk through um, this interaction here in chapter 48. When it gets down to 21, 
It says, Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Right? So he, he's recognizing in the future, God's not going to abandon you then either. He's promised it in the past. He's, he's working in my life now. And in the future, he's still going to bring you back to the land. Right? In, in verse 4, he had called it an everlasting possession. So he's recognizing that in the future, the everlasting possession, he's going to bring you back to the land. Right? Now, it, interestingly enough, Joseph doesn't return to the land. Alive, anyways. Joseph is carried back to the land by Moses in the Exodus when they leave. It actually has a, that they take the bones of Joseph with them back to the land as the nation of Israel returns to the land because God is with them. God's blessed, promised blessing in the past. He's at work in their life now and he is going to bless in the future. Right? That's, that's kind of what Jacob is remembering. So here's the question. How does that apply to us? And we have to be a little bit careful here because we can't just take promises of blessing to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and say, oh, that applies to me, and, and, and pop them on there. So we have to be a little bit careful with, with recognizing how does that apply to me and to my life. And I think from a principle standpoint, it does apply that I need to stop and evaluate and look at my life and recognize the blessings that God has given me in the past, the promise of blessing. I need to recognize how he's working in my life now because here's where he is. And, and I need to recognize the promise of future blessing as well. So in the same sense that Jacob says, God has worked in the past, he's working out, I need to do that same sense in my life. And so part of the challenge that I want to lay out for you guys this morning is simply to take time this week and stop and remember and maybe even write down, how has God blessed you in your life? What are some of those blessings? It is, it is a good practice for us to stop and remember where he's been at work. Where has he blessed you? And it's different for every one of us, what that blessing looks like. I know for, for me, in my life, I stop, I think of my parents. They have been a huge blessing in my life, instrumental in my life, in raising me to be who I am today. My, my parents, my family, my, my two brothers, I would include in that, um, were, were a major blessing in my life. Laura is a major blessing in my life. Maybe the biggest blessing that God has given me is, is Laura, is my wife. And we celebrated 21 years this year. And so, yeah, it's exciting. And so, a huge blessing. And you know, God started that when I was a teenager. We met. We were 19. And so, we've been able to, to share those years together. That's been a major blessing. God has blessed us with two children, uh, Spencer and Sean, and, and watching them grow up. That is a, a major blessing in my life. But as I said, that's different for everybody. And, and what we have to be careful with, and I'll, I'll even set this out as a, a warning because it can be a little bit of a temptation, is to start to try to compare, right? Well, you've been blessed, but my blessing doesn't look like your blessing. Right? And we have to be a little bit careful to make sure that we don't allow the comparison to rob us of our joy. So simply stop and say, how has God been at work in my life, what do the blessings in my life look like? That's the real question, right? Here's the, the next part I want to point out about that, as far as the blessing that he's already offered us, right? That he's already offered us. I want to read a, in Romans chapter 4. Thanks, Claire. I'll just do that. Um, in, in Romans chapter 4, it says, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Right? That's the real blessing. I can look back and, and thank God for the blessing in my family, right? for my wife, for my children. Those are amazing blessings, but they pale in comparison to the offer that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ, of salvation. It, it, it doesn't even come close. Whatever the blessings are that you've received on this earth, whatever it looks like, it, it could be far greater than blessings I received. It doesn't matter. It pales in comparison. It doesn't even come close to matching the offer that he gives us through his son, Jesus Christ, that we are blessed simply because we accept him as Lord and Savior, that we are blessed because our sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. We are blessed because, and, and I love that song that, that Drew sang earlier. And it has that, that, that he went from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. That really stuck with me this morning. That a throne of endless glory to the cross. And he does that for the one purpose of going to the cross. To redeem us so that we might be saved. Guys, that's the biggest blessing that we could possibly imagine. And, and it, it dwarfs everything that could possibly be in my life. I've got a lot of blessing in my life. I've got some amazing things. But the blessing of salvation through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is by far the greatest. So we need to recognize that above all else. We need to recognize both. He's been at work in our life, but he's offered us so much. We also need to recognize what's currently happening in our life. And you know, that, that, that can be difficult sometimes to know, well, what is he doing in my life? So I, I want to give you a little bit of the visual here. This uh, Friday, uh, before we left, I was up here, and our banners, it, there's a windstorm that came through on Friday. And so those banners that hang out front, they just were all over the place. And a few of them had come off the hooks, and they had swung all the way up and were tied up. Like the bottoms were tied on the hooks, and it was, so they were a mess. So I went and I got out the ladder and was rehanging the banners. I was here by myself. Um, but I, I was out there, and I, I was rehanging the banners, and so I, I kind of worked my way down. I'd hang one, and then I'd tie it to the rocks in the bottom, and I'd hang the next one tied to the rocks, and I was working my way down. And so I, I hung the fifth one down, and I was down below, and I was tying it on the rocks, and I see this kind of flash of light go by, and I realized the wind had, was still blowing, and the ladder that I had just been on went shroom and just crashed into the, the front porch. And I thought, wow. I guess I could have been on that. That would have hurt. And I think, you know, there was blessing in that I wasn't on the ladder. I don't know if my weight would have kept it from blowing over or not. Maybe it would have. But I'm also like a sail up there too. So maybe it, I don't know. But there was blessing there. There was blessing that I wasn't under it when it came across. Right? So I was directly on it. So if I had been on the next one over, you know, then I wouldn't have fallen off it, but I would have got it in the back of the head. So there, there's, there's blessing that we see in our life as God takes care of us, as he guides us, as he directs us. To open our eyes and see where he's doing, and, and this is a small example, right? To open our eyes and to see where he's at work and what he's doing in our life is an important thing for us to do. To look for where he's at work, to look for where he's blessing. Now, I know what you're thinking. Sometimes you think, well, Kurt can't see me because I'm in the audience. I, I can see all of you. Right? Even sometimes I know what you're thinking. Right? So here, here's, what, here's what you're thinking. Sometimes I'm on the ladder. Right? Sometimes I don't see the blessing of having been off of it or, or not having been under it. Sometimes the ladder does hit me in the head. Sometimes I am on the ladder when the wind comes through and I fall. Right? What do I do with that? And I think we see that as we work through the text towards the very end of this interaction of, 
of Jacob interacting with, with, his, with his children. What happens when I'm on the ladder? Here, here's what he says in, when we get to chapter 50 in Genesis. I'll flip back over. When we get to chapter 50, this is what's just happened. Jacob has died. And they have the, the big procession. They take his body back up. They bury him in Cana in the promised land, and, and they return. His brothers are scared at this point because they think, well, now dad's gone. What if Joseph takes it out on us now because we sold him into slavery? So they're still, still feeling the guilt of selling him into slavery, and they're still worried that maybe Joseph had just said, I forgive you because dad was here, and now dad's gone. There's no nothing to shelter us from him taking revenge on us now. What he just he could kill us and, and be done with it. So they're scared. So they kind of reach out to him a little bit. This is Joseph's response to his brothers. He says in verse 20, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Here's what he's saying. You intended this for evil. You did evil. But God used that evil for tremendous blessing. That's important for us. And it's the theme throughout the Joseph story, right? He's been sold into slavery, and God redeems and uses the whole situation for this incredible outcome, for this preservation of life. God is using the bad and transforms it into good. It, it, that's the Joseph story. He's, he's sold into slavery and, and he's used to preserve life. And, and Joseph realizes it at the end. He tells it, he says, y'all, y'all intended this for bad, but God used it for good. What we have to recognize is that sometimes in our life, the worst situations, the situation where I am on the ladder when it blows over, the worst situations, we have to have the faith that God can redeem the bad for something beautiful. That's difficult. I'm, I'm not trying to say that that's easy at all. But to simply trust him and to say, God, this is a terrible spot I'm in, and it's difficult. I'm looking for the blessing. I don't see it. But I'm going to set it at the foot of your throne. The throne of endless glory. I'm going to set it at the foot of your throne and trust that you can redeem this bad, terrible place I'm in for something beautiful. He is the God of all creation. He is very capable of doing that. That's what he does. He takes things like his son Jesus Christ on the cross and he redeems it for the most beautiful thing that we sing praises about because we've been redeemed. He can take whatever bad situation's happening and he can redeem it for something beautiful. That's what he does. So if we're going to recognize the blessing in our life, we have to start to understand that. We have to be able to recognize that God is a God of redemption, that he restores, that he takes the bad and he transforms it to good. That's the way he works. And we can remember the blessing that he has promised us, the everlasting blessing, the salvation in his son Jesus Christ, that it's not just about the here and the now. That's going to be gone like a vapor but it's about the eternal blessing, to spend forever with him, basking in his glory. That's what we look for. That's what we long for. So I want to close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it talks about that. And I just want to read it and, and let that sit with us as, as we close. It starts off in, in uh, verse 7. 
and this is Paul writing, this is, he says, but we have the treasure in earthen vessels, earthen vessels being earthly, our bodies, so that the surprising greatness of the power will be of God, not from ourselves. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. I want to skip down to verse 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things, for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. So as grace spreads, as more people hear the grace of Jesus Christ, his glory abounds. But it goes on here. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart, but through our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The light affliction that we have now, guys, it can produce the eternal glory for God. The reminder simply for us is to stay focused on the things that are not seen because that's eternal. The, the, the things that are seen are temporal. They will pass. God can use whatever's going on for beautiful things, but it's short. The focus is on that which is unseen as of now, but will be made seen the eternal, the promise, the opportunity to spend forever with him. That's the biggest thing. That's the blessing you look for. So this week, take the time to write down some of the blessings that you see in your life. Remember them. Know that the biggest one is looking to eternity, but remember how he's worked in the past how he's working now, and the promise that he will continue to be at work in our lives in the future. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, we thank you for the work you're doing in our lives. We thank you for the love that you've shown us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that you've shown us. Father, we just pray that you would guide us and direct us, that you would give us the strength and the wisdom to live as you've called us to live, to recognize where you're working in our lives, to recognize how we can share with the people around us your love and your grace and your mercy. So we just pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.